Welcome to lesson 19, where we're going to talk about functions. Functions are a way to create reusable code that you can call from within your scripts. Let's jump in and take a look at an example. Here is a very simple function definition. Let me get out of the way and show you that it starts with this keyword function. Don't name your variables function. Bad idea. Okay, and then the function name follows right after that. You can see that on line four. So this one's called say hello. Note the case. This is very similar to how we name variables. However, if you've got a style guide, make sure that you adhere to that. The open and close parentheses are where optional parameters or arguments go that the function can use as variables that it can work on. We'll look at that in the next example. And then all of your code fits between the opening and closing curly brace. It could be one line, it could be multiple lines. In this case, I've got a very simple GS info. This is the function definition. It doesn't do that GS info until somebody calls that function. And there it is on line seven. And somebody jumps up and says, hey, I wanna run the function called say hello. And it will do that. As you would expect, we'll pop that into scripts background. It declares this function, says it's ready for use. Now go ahead and say hello. Seems rather trivial because it's one line. I could have just printed this out. What's the point, Chuck? The point is if I wanted to say hello from anywhere in that a longer script, or maybe it's in a UI action, or maybe it's in a business rule, I could declare that function on the system and say, all right, it's time to say hello and spit that out. And somebody says, no, 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 no. We don't want to say hello. We want to say howdy and change one line of code and everybody else says say howdy, even if it's declared and used some, or excuse me, even if it's used, it's only declared one place, but it's used elsewhere, we've got that option. Let's move on to a little more sophisticated example, script two for lesson 19. Again, these are available in the GitHub repo. This one is called two Celsius, and I've declared this with an argument, a parameter called Fahrenheit. So my function is going to convert a temperature from Fahrenheit to Celsius. And of course, here's the var c, I'll output an integer of a variable, or excuse me, a floating point number of c for Celsius. Let's name this somewhat normal. And the formula is available on the internet. You can find the conversion temperature very easy. And then it displays what is in that variable c. And I'm going to call this twice. Once with a temperature of 32, 32 Fahrenheit is zero c. I know that from when I was in grade school and 100 Fahrenheit converts to about 37 point something Celsius. Let's copy that and run it. Back up and put in the new code and away we go, zero and 37, seven. Now notice in this script that I've got the calculation and the output happening at the same time. What if I want my caller script to get a value back? Well, that's where I use this keyword return. Yeah, don't name your variables return. It's a reserved keyword in JavaScript. And it's doing the calculation. Doesn't even save it in a variable. I could if I wanted to, if I wanted to evaluate if C is actually calculating correctly rather than just, hey, return this. And trust me, it works. This has already been tested and it's a pretty simple formula. But return is how we get a value out of a function. You only get one. You get one return value. It could be an integer, it could be a string, it could be a Boolean, or it could be a more complex data type that we'll look at in a future lesson. So here we have two Celsius called again with 32 and we're storing it in var C. Then later we're taking C and reworking it with what is 212 Fahrenheit when you convert it to Celsius. If you remember, it's 100. Let's take that as an example of how to use a return to get a value out of a function. We know how to get one in through the parameter. You pass it between these parentheses and that's what ends up for the value of Fahrenheit. Pass it in this parentheses and a second time, it will run the same function with a different value. And away we go. We've got zero, we put 32 in, we get zero out. We put 100 in, we get two, or excuse me, we put 212 in, we get 100 out. So our Fahrenheit to Celsius converter is working just fine. Let's take a look at what happens when you've got variables out here and variables in here? There are two different levels of variables. We call this scope, variable scope 
looks something like this. Here you can see, just like in the second example, I declare a variable called C. And it's known from this curly brace to this curly brace. It's the, in the scope of the two Celsius function. And sadly, this guy out here is trying to use C. Well, the scope of it is between those curly braces. So what do you think is going to happen? Well, if I were using a script editor in ServiceNow, it would say, what is C? What are you doing here? This isn't right. You're using C out of scope. This is actually what we call a local variable. It's local to the two Celsius group or function. <laughs> so let's copy that, find out just what happens when you actually try and run this and it's not available. The syntax engine or the JavaScript engine goes, what? What is C? I'm not going to run this. It's, it's just horrible. You're trying to use something that doesn't exist and that's a bad idea. So just wanted to throw that in to show you what happens if you try to use a local variable outside of its scope? So how could we fix that? Well, we could, in fact, declare C out here or do like we did before, var C equals, we've got to call this, 2 Celsius, spell it correctly. We'll send 100 and then you think that'll work? We only need one var C. So we're going to do var C, we're going to call two Celsius, pass it 100, it will do its calculation, come up with 37.77777777, and try and print that. What happens if you do that? And it says 37.7, now wait a minute, we've got two Cs. What's going on? Well, this one is global. This one exists outside of the function. And there's nothing wrong with that because it's not manipulating anything. There's a new declaration of C in here. If I had left this off, that's a potentially dangerous thing because now it's saying the only C I know about is out there in the wild. Everybody has access to that C and that could potentially be a bad time. It will work in this case because nobody else is messing with it. But if I had another function that didn't declare C, this is a reason why you always want to make sure you get that var keyword on there. I've had this happen where I sent something off into a loop and it came back with crazy numbers because I forgot the keyword var once. It was really wild. Expected something to run 10 times and it ran, sometimes it ran 1100, sometimes it ran 332, sometimes it ran six. And I went, what is wrong with my for loop? It's, oh, I see it. So in order to fix a crazy situation like that, let's take a look at slightly more complex. We have a global variable called convert to. Which way do you want to do the conversion? To Fahrenheit or to Celsius? Now, here are my two functions, one that converts to Celsius and one that converts to Fahrenheit. You can check the math on your own. They do work. And then sort of a master function called convert temp that says, what do you want to convert to? I'm only passing it one parameter. So rather than saying convert temp, and passing it a number and saying Celsius or Fahrenheit every time I call it, I tell this thing once, these are Fahrenheit conversions. Much like you have a language selector or a time zone selector on ServiceNow, you can, it, it, it doesn't have to ask you every time, well, what, what time zone would you like that in? It just knows because it's more or less a global variable for you. This is similar kind of thing where I'm converting it and that global variable says which direction you're going. It's not converting it to C. So I'm going to, this is what's going to run. One line down here that says, go convert the temperature 100. And it says, all right, I'm in convert temp. You told me 100. On line 23, let's do it this way. On line 23, it says, do you want to go to Celsius? I says, no, 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 no. Convert to global variable, because notes there's no convert to variable in this function. So it can't override that. The only convert to it knows about is that global one. It says, that was F, right? Yeah, that was F. So I'm not going to convert to Celsius. I'm going to convert to Fahrenheit. And we should see the Fahrenheit equivalent of 100 pop out of this thing if we pop that into script background. So there's a return. Note that I'm also calling a function within a function. Nothing wrong with this. It's a very nice way to break down more complex code into its subatomic components where two Fahrenheit and two Celsius, that's all they do is convert to the temperature one way or the other. And then convert temp says, 
you know, I don't need all that code. If you had a function that has 600 lines of code in it, you probably want to think about, are there smaller blocks that I can break this down into? Even if you only use it once, it's very handy to put code in a function. If that function is called once, it served its usefulness in testing and debugging later. So let's put that in there. It says, yes, I want to convert 212 to Fahrenheit. It worked. If I go the other way, if I go the other way, come on, get that back there. There we are. If I go the other way and say, let's convert 100 from Fahrenheit to Celsius, it's going to get down here and say, oh, you want to convert to Celsius. Therefore, I'm going to call two Celsius with 100. It goes up, does the conversion, returns C. C ends up ricocheting out this return statement and gets down to the GS info. And there it is again. So we've proven that out. One more example that I want to show you. And this is what we call a self-running function. Now, I have declared a variable i. And note that I have this little bit different syntax on here. I still have a function. And I still have open and close parentheses, open and close curly braces. But there's something surrounding them. And that is a pair of parentheses, and then right at the end of this is another pair. This is called a self-running function. Handy at times, you will see this in service now, here and there. And the place you would want to use this is in your UI actions would be a good place to ensure that nobody is messing with your local variables. Note that I forgot to say var i here. Well, if I say var i, that overrides this one. I've now declared a local variable that has higher order of precedence. It means it will be used instead of any other i you see on the system. So this is, I'll leave it in its original state. You can see I declared i is 20 up here. Then I declare this self-running function. It's going to run on its own. I don't have to do anything. Notice nobody is ever calling nothing. There's no function to call here. So let's copy and paste this into script's background. These are quite handy, and I'll show you where they get protected. So i is 20, then it runs down here and says, no, wait, i is 10. Display i equals something, then set i to 3 and print i. So this one's fairly obvious. What, whether or not you understand what that self-running function does, it's, it's irrelevant to these last two lines. So I should see i equals 3 at the very end. But the question is, is i going to be 20 or is i going to be 10 in this first one? And it says i is indeed 10. If i were to say var i here, it's still going to be 10 because my local one is now taking over. Let's comment this out just for a little education purposes to understand local and global scope better and say, now, i is 20. This one's going to say, I'm declaring my own i. I'm going to use that for my own. And then print that and then not reinitialize it to 3, but print out whatever it had. Is it going to be 10? Is it going to be 20? I'm going to vote for 20 because this is a local one. Now, if... I left that out. Is it going to affect the outer scope? Therein lies the $10 question, and it does, because it doesn't, it's no longer local to the curly braces. So just like any function, the self-running function adheres to the same rules of local and global scope. So we've got a way to pass information into a function, run some code, pass information out of a function, call another function, lots of great information here. Where would you use any of these? Well, you can use variable, global variables to make it easy to declare something and say, I want this script to run this way. Here is a table name. I don't want to type the table name because something may change. I may want different fields. You could pass parameters in to say, this time you run the function on this field. Next time I want you to run on a different field or a different value. So you could use these, as, think of them like system properties that's going to affect the behavior of that function. So you could also set these in a script where you want to avoid passing the same parameter over and over and over again. For example, if I've got a series of functions that operate on a user, say, give me the user's name, give me the user's address, give me the user's 
login ID. And instead of saying user, 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 user every time, you declare a global function, a global variable that says, here's the user's sys ID, just go get that record. Or here's the user's record. We'll do records in a little bit. But you've got that information once. Why, especially if you're hitting the database, why go get it every time? And say, well, I've got a sys ID, I better get the record. Here's the address. I've got a sys ID, get the record. Here's the zip code. Get the, it, it just, it's, it's craziness. So you can set this thing once and go, there, I did my database duties. Let's move on. I don't need to do that every time. You could, in fact, speed up your script by not hitting the database. And we'll get into database in just a little bit. But that may be another use case for a global variable. They're not evil, but be very, very careful when using them so you understand what scope you're in so you don't accidentally drive it crazy. That's it for Lesson 19. I will talk to you again real soon. Bye.